Hey everybody, I'm Ryan McCaffrey. Welcome to what I think is a once-in-a-lifetime edition of Xbox Podcast Unlock, the world's number one Xbox podcast. My name is Ryan McCaffrey, and I am incredibly excited and honored to be joined by the following three men. If you are a diehard Xbox fan, you already know who they are. I will introduce them quickly. Uh, to my far, far left, Seamus Blackley, the creator of the original Xbox. The man was on a plane, drafted up a, uh, an idea for a console at Microsoft and uh, made it happen. To his right, Peter Moore joined the company uh, right around the uh, time of the Xbox 360's 2003, launch. 2003, 2003, a little before. Yeah. Yeah, and then, of course, Phil Spencer, you know him, is the current head of Xbox, but also a Microsoft lifer. Yes. You've been, you've been Microsoft in Carta, this man right here. 1988, Microsoft started in Microsoft. Carta. So uh, dirt. makes a man hard working for Carta. <laughs> this this show is out. about a celebration of the Xbox's history over the last 15 years, which these three men uh, wonderfully represent. Uh, I don't think this has ever been done before. Where we've ever had all of the eras of Xbox represented in the same room and and talking about it. Uh, and I just want to you know the, we're we're here to share stories of the, of. This machine and this, this, what has become this just fundamental brand that everybody knows and everybody loves and has in their living rooms. And as somebody who's been playing Xbox and covering Xbox uh, in, the, in the games media since 2002, I really sincerely appreciate the three of you guys being here. Uh, so I want to start with Seamus. Uh, Seamus, I wanted to ask you, had, have you ever thought that there would be one day three, that we'd be on the third Xbox console? Did you ever think it would last this long? I, listen, you know, I'm just, uh, I'm still kind of surprised that it's a thing, right? Because, yeah. and I don't know what you, I, I'd be interested to know what you guys thought when you first heard of Microsoft making a game console, because, you know, it was either astonishment or laughter or that's totally absurd that Microsoft would make a game console. I can remember going up to EA and having them actually want to call Microsoft to be sure that there was like an adult who actually agreed with me that I was there representing a new game console. Um, so I, you know, frankly, I'm just like, uh, uh, still I find it a little bit odd that you know, it's such a big deal and it's a worldwide brand and everybody knows about it. Because you know, we're, from where I sit, like Xbox, the green color for Xbox, yeah. is because a guy called Horace Luke when we had to have a logo for a meeting or something, yeah. he had one of those awesome sets of markers, you know, with the paint tips. Right. You know? A nice artist marker. Yeah, and so everybody immediately stole all of them, right? The only color he had left was like the green nobody wanted. <laughs> and so we made all this artist stuff with green, and now it's like still green. And I find that bizarre. I mean, can you imagine? Cause it's like Horace and the green marker, and now, you know, on buses in foreign countries. What? It's crazy. Uh, Peter Moore, what is it about the Xbox 360 that you think made it so successful and beloved? Well, you know, uh, to Seamus's point, Microsoft's an interesting place to work, and Phil's been there all of your life, all of your working life. Yes. Did, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's not easy to get embedded within the culture something different other than <laughs> Windows and SQL Server and Exchange Server, right. and, and and this ability for us, and I'm, I'll say us for the. For the purposes of this show, this evening, yeah, was we needed to, to to get this company mobilized around an entertainment brand, a consumer brand, and something that was different. And we were taking on Sony. And to be very clear, and Seamus can maybe verify this, this was as much about blocking Sony to the television mm -hmm. as it was creating a brand. That was the original intent. There was paranoia in Redmond, Washington that Sony would somehow own the living room. Yeah. Now, well, I, I, and Sony I, explicitly said it a couple of times, which, yeah. and strangely enough, every time they said it, I get all excited because it was more ammo to use. Absolutely. But the 360, we were very, very focused on coming out first, coming out with great games, coming out at the right price point, and focusing on delivering an online experience because Xbox Live had, you know, its nascency in the original Xbox. Yeah, but yeah. It, I don't know, when I got there was maybe 200,000 people that we were trying desperately. Well, that was before to. Halo 2 came out and blew it up. When Halo 2 eventually came out, and somebody had to freaking tattoo their body to make bungee. <laughs> we're gonna get to, to that too. That we'll get to that oh, too. There we go. So, but but no, I, I, some of the greatest years of my life to be to be. Well, I'll tell you, somebody should just say it, Peter. Like the so we barely got this football over the line, and you know it almost killed everybody. And it was just like you know whatever it takes to get this thing up, right? Well, and you, you made it into a business and a brand because honestly. 
it was a piece of hardware with some games on it, okay? And you came in and you put together your organization that made it into a brand. And it was astonishing to watch for me to see it become this like professional marketing and entertainment organization. At the same time, when the great majority, I don't want to say the great majority, but the majority of Microsoft employees actually resented the fact. That I've heard this, that. That this little irreverent group out in Millennium, where yeah. we're the gravel pit. We're 520 uh, and fell off a cliff. Right, the Millennium the building is no, what you're referring you, you to. Seriously, you drive out there, right. and for a couple Union months, you'd have, to, you'd have to duck the gunshots. So like, yeah. you were like, <laughs> and, and, and half of it was that we, we were the rebels. This is Star Wars. We were the rebels. We didn't want to be part of the Borg. Yeah. That there was the empire. More and more. We couldn't, we couldn't, nobody would have believed that we could make a game console if we'd smelled at all. No. Like the Borg. Yeah. We had to consciously represent as being different. Yeah. Phil, uh, you started at Microsoft in 1988, yeah. as you mentioned. What's your earliest memory of the Xbox at all? Like, what is the, f the first time you remember either hearing anything about it or seeing it or running into someone? <laughs> when he first got resentful. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I, uh, so I joined uh, Microsoft Studios or Game Studios under Ed Freeze in 2000 thousand running a studio the first that I had heard of the original Xbox was going in to see a demo of Halo before we'd acquired Bungie because I was friends with Ed and some yeah. Alan Hartman Probably and on a bunch the Mac, of people right? it was on the Mac, Mac. Yeah. yeah and uh, this was actually at the time and I've said this before there wasn't really consensus in the organization that Halo was going to be the game. We had Munch's Odyssey. No. A lot of people believed that Lorne Lanning with Munch's Odyssey, which was a nice game, sure. uh, was going to be the game that was going to carry the water for uh, the original Xbox. There was but Jez Sands game. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. With the little girl with the yeah. giant hammer? Yeah. Whatever that, Malice? Yeah. Malice. Didn't ship. Yeah. Uh, it did ship. It did ship, but it had different mapping right? and had That's lighting. Right. It moved. Yeah. Uh, but that was it. It was going in with Ed and seeing a build of Halo to look at and say, okay, is this uh, a studio that we should acquire? Is this a game that we should add? Because we were PC uh, studios up until that point, right. right? Flight Sim and Age and a bunch of other things. That was our, our focus and we were trying to pivot over to console. And uh, yeah, it was, it was an interesting time. It was Microsoft, as you said, trying to create something new. And if you look through Microsoft's history, creating new hasn't always been our strength. No, but when Microsoft gets behind it, nothing can stop it. I mean, that's the thing, like, that you'd meet guys who had been there. A lot of them went to researcher places, or, you know, Ed, Ed F., we should put a shout out to Ed Freeze. Yep. Um, you know, and there are so, so many powerful guys who, when they just had the right idea and they could get behind it, like, nothing could stop. It was awesome. But, you know, the, the, the Bungie guys were so mad. I remember Jason getting super angry with me because Jason I, Jones, I, had screwed, I had screwed up his plan to make Halo. And do you remember the, the Halo joke reel with the chocolate yeah. bar? To make this awesome Mac game. And instead now, somehow I had pulled some kind of like mind jujitsu on Ed Freeze to make Ed Freeze suddenly force Jason to make it a console game. It was a wicked pissed off. But things worked out okay. It did, yeah. So what, on a similar note, what is each of yours favorite uh, original Xbox game? And Peter, if you want to go 360, I'll give you that. But I'll go she, Xbox. All right, original Xbox. Crimson Skies. I could always Crimson remember. Skies, I solid Crimson choice. Skies. Yeah. What was it about Crimson Skies that, that you uh, remember first well? first game I played when I arrived at Microsoft and got my Xbox. Picked it up, really put my back out when I picked it up, but then... Yeah, started, no, it's the controller that puts your back that's out. That's right, and, but then started playing, I loved it, and I could just see the, the, the kind of, I don't know, the, the three-dimensional motion of the planes, and sat there in my little office in Millennium B and played that yeah. thing forever. You could get out of the plane, too, which was cool at the it time. It was very cool. And then we decided that we couldn't afford to make the Xbox anymore, and how fast could we bury this thing, because the hard drive was costing us more right. than that. You took a bath problem. on every single one. Ever oh, sold, I, right? I did forever. Oh, yes. nice. yeah. The yeah. hard drive, though, is a really interesting story because I remember going into the 360 and people had looked at the hard drive as kind of one of the casualties of the original Xbox. And I would say over and over that you wouldn't have the Halo game that you see with Halo 1 if it wasn't for the hard drive. Yes, there wasn't some kind of DVR feature, right. but in terms of the streaming capability that we had with the hard drive, it enabled the games that really made us stand out relative to the yeah, competition or the game. Yeah, that, yeah that's really so true. So it was, it was critical, maybe not front and center, but without the hard drive, you wouldn't have had Halo. 
You guys and know this, in, like in a leadership role, there's like a limited number of shit fits that you can throw to like just say no to something and you to kind of trade. And there is a, I didn't even remember this till just now, there was like a couple of pivotal meetings where I consciously made this decision to like say I would quit and walk away if there was no hard drive. Yeah. And in exchange, in exchange I had to stop complaining about the giant controller. And so I just <laughs> ate the giant controller. <laughs> so no, so that's a good trade off I think. The controller yeah. got replaced, hard drive turned out to be pretty hard good. Hard drive was critical. Well, Anybody who thinks and the so, hard drive so this was is what so on 360 you guys obviously had some kind of tortured process with the hard drive, no hard drive versions, and the costs and all that kind of stuff. It's a nightmare for developers. Like, how did how did you guys work that out? What what? Well, it was price point. We needed what, yeah. four gig, four gigabyte, and we felt we needed to get to two ninety nine, three forty nine, and that was the difference between the two. And the no hard drive, hard drive, oh, and all the other stuff a hard drive needs bigger power, all that stuff too, right? It was boy, that was a long eighteen yeah. months going into that. Yeah, we hated the arcade. So, yeah. favorite original Xbox game, Phil? Voodoo Vince, you know that. I do know that. Yeah. Oh, tell, first game, tell, tell me why. Tell me why. Well, first, Clayton uh, is still Clayton, the creator of Beep Industries, uh, who created Voodoo Vents, still part of Microsoft Studios. Great guy to have. Uh, and I, I've told this story before. It was really the first game. I have two daughters. They're now 19 and 16, but at the time, obviously, they were much younger. And uh, I finished the game with my youngest sitting on my lap, my oldest sitting right next to us, jointly solving the puzzles yeah. with the controller in my hand. But it was, I guess, brain co-op. Right, and they felt like they were playing the game with me. And you know, for me, games are about those experiences that you have, yes, on screen, but also kind of in your mind and in your heart. Right, and yeah. when we see we see content that really pulls at at all three things. You kind of your compelling gameplay, how you think about the game, and how it makes you feel. Uh, those are special moments. And for me, finishing that game, my daughters will still you know speak fondly of finishing the. Cosmo at the end, if people remember, kind of, uh, you know, laddering up the big, the big robot at the end and finishing, and it'll just always mean something to me. I still have my no. Voodoo Vince plushie. So do I. Mm -hmm. work. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Seamus, you, of course, you've made many a video game in your day. You worked at Looking Glass, of all places, one of the most revered and, and respected studios of all time. Well, you're well, trying to kill me with nostalgia here? What the? Well, <laughs> it's kindness. It's yeah, not okay. nostalgia, it's kindness. What's your favorite original Xbox game? Man, uh, Azeric, Rise of Parathia. <laughs> no, um, that was in, in the great in the great history of games at that time, and you guys know this from being old gamers. Like name of guy colon place where he's from. Yeah. Like that gaming <laughs> that that fine, often fantasy game uh, naming convention. Um, Mr. Halo from from Combat Evolved. I, I still have uh, like a, a, a dev kit. Like a pre-release dev kit with an early version of Halo on it. Yeah. Well, I turn it back in. I'm just saying in my mind, exactly somewhere, right, yeah. just in my mind. You're gonna get a 1099 at the end of the year. Yeah. Um, that has this pre-release version of Halo on it, and I, I like every every couple of years I play that, and because I, I remember, like amongst all the things, like the idea of Microsoft making a console that doesn't blue screen and all these other yeah. crazy ideas people yeah. had. One of them was that a shooter will never work without a mouse and a keyboard. And this was a this was a, a a widely and passionately held belief of you know of the of the teeming internet crowd who would hate everything you'd ever Except say. Except for fans of Goldeneye, that might be. The okay, <laughs> but the uh, you know the control scheme that those guys came up with and the the it's way great. that they made it all work, and also you know a very early big 3D world. Yeah. In which everything was consistent. You know, there was nothing in the world of the original Halo that didn't work. So you bought it that you were there, stock and lock, stock and barrel. So, you know, it still holds up. But the probably, you know, so I think that's really important. My favorite game is probably still the original Psychonauts. Nice. Yeah. Nice yeah. choice. Which you guys ended up not publishing. Well, it did been, come out. That would have been over here. Yeah. <laughs> you ended up not publishing. <laughs> well, we had funny enough. I guess funny enough. Poor planning enough. We had three platformers: Voodoo Vince, a game called Torque that actually yeah, ended up coming that. out, and Psychonauts that all had the same ship date. <laughs> and we said, okay, this probably isn't gonna work. And uh, Bonnie Ross was running the studio, <laughs> who's now running Halo, was running the, uh, the Psychonauts studio. I wanna say studio. something really mean about Tim and ship dates, but I'm not gonna <laughs> yeah, say yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, we could've just, just waited. Not say it. We could've waited. Okay. Uh, she was running Double Fine? No, she was running our internal oh, studio. Inter okay. That yeah. was managing the relationship with Double Fine. I was managing the relationship with Beep. 
uh, and a person named Adam Wax was managing the relationship on Torque. And all of these games were supposed to ship on the same day. And I remember having the conversation with Ed, we can't keep all these games, can't have three platformers ship on the same day. Ed's very genre focused in the way yeah. you look at our portfolio. So, well, you kind um, of are now too. But. Ed was more yeah, genre focused yeah. in the way he looks at the portfolio. Well, but it's also a front. I mean, Ed's also just a really nice guy, and he loves games. And yeah. like the idea of not being able to do them all kills him. Yeah. And the uh, so we ended up Psychonauts. We we ended up moving on. Yeah. But great game, fantastic, yeah, stunning. Uh, Seamus, you started to mention the Duke controller, so I wanted to ask you the Duke. Were you involved with it? Take take me back to the Duke. I mean, it's sort of it's quite legendary for. Uh, Certain reasons now. Uh, what was, the, well, what was so the goal with it? Let's just say <laughs> that starting out at a software company yeah. and deciding that you're going to ship a game console involves what might be referred to or termed a steep learning curve. True. Um, and, you know, there are design issues and all sorts of things. I mean, to cut a long story short, what I heard which may or may not be true, okay. but the, the story that was represented to me, possibly in order to put me off complaining so much, <laughs> okay, there may have been some manipulation of me involved in this, was that somebody's like brother-in-law or something okay. had an electronics design firm, mm -hmm. like in Washington or somewhere, somewhere friendly, somewhere not China where we couldn't figure out anything that was going on. And they had designed the internal uh, circuit board for the controller mm -hmm. with the features that we wanted, which was two analog sticks that were sort of off yeah. put. Things that seem obvious now, which were batshit at of. that point. Yeah. Right? Um, and he could make this, but the circuit board was essentially the size of a large dinner plate. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, this poor woman, a very talented industrial designer called Denise, was given the job of fitting this large formal dinner plate <laughs> inside of some industrial <laughs> design yeah. that would make it seem like a game controller. And so she <laughs> accomplished that task. And then much consumer research was done after the fact to prove that, no, 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 people love a giant controller. Yeah. <laughs> and I can remember putting it on my leg in Japan and trying to say, see, you can rest it on your leg. And this Japanese <laughs> TV host put it on his leg, which is much smaller than mine, and it immediately fell off. And he said, no. <laughs> And I'm like, uh... <laughs> well, th then that brings us to the Controller S, which mm -hmm. debuted in Japan. Thank you. Uh, well, did... Is there any way we're going to sell anything in Japan? Because yeah. right. you could, the, the, the Duke was a non-starter in the Asian market, yeah. period. So what, well, what, one of the things we did, actually, to try to get the smaller controller argument started up again, after yeah. I had made the political decision I couldn't complain about it anymore, <laughs> was go to Japan and talk to Japanese developers, and we had this letter. And we had so many developers who were complaining about the controller, we actually put it in a spreadsheet. So we used Excel, which inside of Microsoft, mm -hmm. now you're serious. It's a nuclear <laughs> option. I'm going to give you Ed Excel. invented it's Excel. A, it's one step before a PowerPoint. And that's, you know, <laughs> which is the real nuclear option. But uh, uh, so we had all these Japanese developers complaining about it. And when, before we started, we were actually just talking about the biggest Xbox controller of all time. The Steel Battalion. The Steel yeah. Battalion controller. Oh, yeah. So I'm in the middle of getting, of secretly arranging for all the Japanese developers to complain about the size so that yeah. maybe we can switch it. And I go to Capcom, and it's like the same era. And they open up a door for the secret thing and say, oh, but we also want you to approve this. And they open it up and I'm like, wait, I'm canvassing them to make a smaller controller and you're asking me to approve a desk? It's awesome. Yeah, that Steel Battalion, that would never get made today. I don't know how the heck. That, that well, something I then. used to use, I didn't take it out of the box. And if somebody came to my office and they needed an extra chair, right. they sat on the Steel Battalion <laughs> box. There was a thing with Steel Battalion, was, though. It had a thousand input controls. Yeah. It had sticks and buttons. It was completely intimidating. And if you died, you died. Oh, that yeah. was it? You're safe. Yeah, if you didn't eject before, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. It was, you're Click, done. bang, yeah. So, dead. Peter, uh, you were in charge when uh, EA and Microsoft brokered the deal to get. Uh, EA sports games on Xbox Live, which at the time, if you guys, some people may not remember, I mean, there was a time when online was a nascent thing and it was online on PS2, but not on Xbox Live. You, you helped make, broker the deal that made that happen. Uh, do you have any good anecdotes about that story? Was it super easy or did it, were there like a- Nothing's easy with EA. <laughs> <laughs> you can say that now. I worked there. Um, 
No, I, I mean, I think the theory was at that time, the theory used to be, if you're a first party, you had to own your own sports brand. Yeah, right. That was it. It's when I was at Sega, and you'd been through it. we bid Sega Sports, and then we became 2K, mm -hmm. and then we went to ESPN, and then it was Sega Sports, 2K, ESPN, and it was just ridiculous. In the yeah. end. And then, of course, Take Two bought the brand and made it 2K, and 2K was just a story there. There's an anecdote outside of EA. We were the night before we're shipping for the Dreamcast, couldn't come up with a name for sports. It was the Millennium, and we decided to call it 2K. Wow. Because you remember why 2K was I remember yeah. that, yeah. That's why 2K Sports, that's how it's named. But, um, well, you, you had to go through that too with EASN. ESPN well, got Well, ESPN them. didn't like it, and then of course, you know, the deal we ha now have with ESPN, make sure that we take care it of all, each other. It all comes yeah, back absolutely. around. But no, I think the idea, and when we did XSN Sports uh, at, at Microsoft, we did that for a couple of years. NFL Fever, mm -hmm. I remember Peyton Manning. Um, we did hockey. But look, yeah. yeah, nobody did it better than EA. And, and our resources in Microsoft Game Studios, we're gonna be better deployed somewhere else. And so the, I, we, we kind of stepped away in the end, let EA get on with it, and we started to focus on different games there. So there wasn't any sort of because that's, that's literally my there's next no question. There's no animosity. There's no there's no sort of conspiracy of well, you guys bring you guys bring uh, your games to live, and we'll we'll just make our our yeah. first party sports thing go away for you. No, no, there was none of that. No. It was just a simple business decision business in. that you've got limited resources, development studios that would be better deployed doing things that could drive hardware. Let EA get after the sports genre. EA Sports was where it was at. That deal was with Don. Yeah, and Don Matrick, yeah. depending which company you work for at the time that he did that deal. And, and, and I was on stage and we had- <laughs> Muhammad Ali came out. Yeah, Ali. Yeah, and, yeah that was awesome. And the following year, Robert Gallery of the mm -hmm. Raiders pounded down the shrine. I thought we were gonna collapse the stage that day. <laughs> uh, no, EA was good at that, still good at that. We needed to do some different things. But I for, think that, that that decision was a was a harbinger of a new model in, in a lot of the whole industry. I mean, that was, it was a hard decision. I think you probably had to work really hard to convince people about that. And you had been at Sega up against the monster of EA Sports the whole time you were there. Yeah, like more it. or less. Took them on. And uh, yeah, just let's go. And then you decide, no, no, no. It's like an Aikido approach. And I think that was a that was a, a moment in the history of the games business that was very important remember for Sony how this had relationship nine, worked. Eight, nine studios, mm -hmm. Kelly right. Falk, right? Game Day and all yeah. these titles. NFL Game Day. It, it just made no sense in the end. We were just, it was a finite market and we were splitting it and the cost of licensing fees to the leagues and the players association was going through the roof. It was better off, to just let EA do it. We'll go put our studios on something well, else. And now you run EA, please make a new uh, Major League Baseball game. But we'll save that for another That was a minute sorry. when you've got Peter Moore <laughs> making a real decision like he's an entertainment company and not like he's a technology company. And that's a big deal. Uh, you guys started to touch on EA. Phil, I'll start with you. Are there any, over the years, you know, you've been on stage a lot now, especially as the head of Xbox, are there any sort of backstage uh, near misses or last second changes or, or like improvised things on stage over the over E3s of past that, that are, would be fun to share now? Fun. I, I don't, <laughs> the, our near misses of gears crashing as mm -hmm. soon as Cliffy walks out on stage uh, well, even two years ago with Patrick, when our sound dropped, Battlefield. The, yeah, that was that was painful. I don't think of them as most most of them as funny. <laughs> I find them kind of painful <laughs> in my past. I mean, pulling off a show like E3, and it's amazing. I go back every year and I kind of watch some of our old E3 shows, and you forget the old shows when there's like a curtain and somebody comes out from behind a curtain holding a controller. Like Johnny Carson. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and now it's a 90 minute television show yeah, yeah. and it's just, it's produced and it's, it's a lot different than it used to be. But you know, it's, it's always somewhat, of, even this, this E3 for us with Rod Ferguson came out, he was playing Gears 4 yeah. on stage and the HoloLens thing with Brother, Minecraft. Brother, you lowered just, a car onto the stage. Yeah, I, mean, I was standing died. below that car at the beginning. But uh, <laughs> you know, the E3 in general, is just always kind of a stressful moment, but also it's such a great moment. I mean, this E3, I thought all of the platform holders showed up incredibly well. Uh, where the games industry is, we kind of entered the third year of this generation, you're seeing the great content. Most of the, the stories about kind of behind the scenes, 
I just prefer to keep in the closet because they, <laughs> they kind of drive me crazy. But maybe Cliff coming out and literally having the game crash as soon as he comes out. For those that don't know, usually what we're doing is the person on stage is playing the game. Yeah. There's somebody behind stage who's playing exactly the same game at the same time. So if something happens, we can switch. Contingency plan. And what's, then the, our what's the code name, Phil Spence? Broken Arrow. Broken and Arrow. <laughs> and then broken the, Arrow. And the third. Like the, Fishy kicks in. Then we go to video. <laughs> like at the end, we're, we're just on video. But we didn't need any video today. Uh, we've hit video a couple times in the past, but I don't think about them as funny. Well, Peter Moore, you once paused a live oh, session of Rock Band on God. stage. <laughs> that was funny. I'm that, glad you thought that so. That was epic. <laughs> Actually, it was funny. It really didn't bother me. I, I, people thought I would, must have been embarrassed. I want to dig it. That was, I'll tell you what happened. We were practicing, so this was 2007. Yeah. I was impressed that you were playing live, just to be fair. Oh, no, we were all playing live, yeah. but there was an issue, and I, I, I figured out what the issue was. We are all playing live. This was the year when E3 became a plumbers and pipe fitters show, yeah. right, in Santa Monica. We oh, decided that all of a sudden E3 had got out of control. Yep. We're going to ratchet everything. It's like when you right. It was at the high school. Yes, Santa, Santa Monica, Monica High School, high school. Yeah. outside. So I was leading off with rock band. It was a great show. We had... We had, at the end, we had Halo, we had Halo. the choir, and, and it was fabulous. And that was cool. what I realized is I wasn't good enough to be able to compensate for the lag because the... It's tough. Yeah. Yeah. It was 50 feet away, yeah. and, and so Alex and Helen, I mean, harmonics. Yep. It, 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 no. <laughs> and in, in rehearsal, I, I stood at the end of the stage, and I nailed it every single time. Yeah. But then showtime, I'm an extra 15 feet back, with with the guitar and I realized A, I couldn't quite see it and B, uh -huh. I was like a millisecond out every time and then I paused it I, and then you start to fail. I remember shouting, yeah. get me back in, get me back in <laughs> and, and they couldn't get me back in. So. And that was uh, Jeff Bell and Reggie Bush. Yep. That was a, it was a great show. <laughs> Seamus, did you, you, you've done a couple of these, right? Any, any uh, fun stories? Along those lines, from the it, stage, like the the idea that that's fun. I mean, I guess it's fun, it's like fun. watching it's snuff fun videos for everybody else. <laughs> but getting getting humiliated like in front of the audience, you know, because the thing that's on your mind is, and it was certainly driven into my mind by uh, the charming and effervescent Mr. Bomber, was that you're representing Microsoft. Yeah and all the shareholders and everybody and all the families, all the people who are hopefully looking to you in this business. And so that, that was always weighing on my, on my head mightily. You know, if I get out there and, you know, and it doesn't work or it actually blue screens, I mean, the, the, the stakes were pretty high at yeah. the start because everybody, you know, people had unfairly or not given Windows this bad reputation. And, you know, now is the console going to do the same thing? And so, I don't know, man. <laughs> Characterizing that is fun. Is like asking a guy, you know, if combat was pretty fun, like in <laughs> Afghanistan, because you're really taking it serious. And then once it's over, though, the sense of relief is incredible. Yeah. You know, and stuff works. But one of the things that Microsoft has always believed in, uh, I think, is really great, is the actual demo, right? There's no nobody's running any software that's right. BS. Like it's all real, which means you're really sweating it. But when you get through it, it's all real. You know, so, that's good. so, so Peter, I'll tell you one funny yeah. story. And I will, I will, I, I apologize to the AMD Corporation because I don't think I ever did this. <laughs> the night before we announced, this was at the Game Developers Conference, not at E3, but the night before we announced the Xbox, like the original big announcement with right. Bill coming out of surprise yeah. at the Game Developers Conference, um, we had we had developed all those big silver X's and all the demos were running live, and we we actually had Kevin back us under the stage on his back with a second controller looking up at a monitor that he could barely see it as our broken arrow. Yeah. Um, we had developed it all with AMD. AMD had helped us do all this crazy soldering to get the brand new video bus going and all the process and all this stuff. The night before, two nights before, Bill had called Andy Grove and they decided to use an Intel processor. Mm. And so Bill went out, <laughs> so all the AMD guys are in the audience and they're all excited. And Bill goes out and he says, with our partner Intel, and I'm standing on the sides, like ready to come out and do the demos and like, you know, announce with him. And I could see all the AMD guys looking like they're gonna kill themselves. Like, the, you just don't get those moments like doing anything else. That was crazy. A little crazy. That was crazy. Uh, speaking of crazy, Peter Moore, you referenced the Halo 2 tattoo incident from E3 incident. 2004. The incident, victory. A tattoo uh, is not an incident. So <laughs> what I wanna know is, uh, whose idea was it? Was it like a last minute thing or was it super planned out in advance? 
I mean, it's, it's, it's become I, a legendary I, story. Yeah, I think, I think there was a level of frustration about four weeks going into E3, whatever year that was, 2004. Four. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we just couldn't get Jason and Bungie and the team. Okay, we, we got we to gotta prove we're going to ship this thing. And it was November 9th that Correct. year. Mm -hmm. Um, you should know if you're looking in the mirror in the uh, morning. Absolutely. <laughs> and I, I, I may have said to probably Charlotte Steibenberg, our head of mm -hmm. PR at the time, David Hufford. Um, Hufford. I think I should just like, maybe what if I tattooed this that would prove this thing's going to ship? And we went from there. And obviously, I got the tattoo. And there was this reveal moment. And it's, it's right here on the right arm. And lifted it up. And um, it became, yeah, it became... Legendary. I'm a little disappointed Phil hasn't picked up the mantle. That's true. Of tattooing his body. Does, does, does Hufford still work for it? Hufford is still there. So yeah. Huff Daddy, Huff Daddy, Phil needs a tattoo, brother. <laughs> Give him a tattoo. We're doing a little better with our dates these days. I don't suppose. I don't suppose we're going to get that jacket off oh, and not. see it. No. That's why I'm wearing a jacket. It's <laughs> a good looking jacket. He came you prepared. Like I like it. Uh, let's see here. Plus he has the pocket square. I like that. It's That's nice. Symbol of a well dressed man. It's a stylish I've man. I've been working all day. <laughs> Phil, uh, is there anything that you know, I mean, you've been at Xbox so long now, is there anything that you know now that you wish you knew back then as it pertains to Xbox? Like any, any sort of lesson or, or lessons that, for, that you, from back then that you just still try to always hang on to now and remember now? I, I like that question. I mean, I think the original Xbox, and Seamus spoke very well about this, like it was how do we isolate a brand and think about the customer and the gamer yeah. and build something that they, and there's a lot of turbulence around in Microsoft and what line. other people might think they want to do with this box. And I think, you know, going into, and I, I, I think about that time, it was a great time, even down in Millennium in the gravel pits. We were, I, I still think of it as the garage band, right? We were down there and we, it, we weren't making a lot of money, but we were making progress. We were gaining customers and fans started to love the brand and the games that we had. And when I think about, frankly, the last three or four years with Xbox One, where there have been some missteps in the, how we're approaching the customer and the gamer and really making sure that our, our product and our kind of essence of what we are as a team mm. shows up is really driven by the customer that we're trying to attract. I think back to those days, because those days were, it was a little bit of duct tape and bailing wire. It was a little bit of maybe some uh, mirrors sometimes as we were trying to get things aligned. But the one thing that, that the team back then really had, we knew who our customer was, yeah, and we yeah. knew what our product needed to do. In fact, we kind of knew who the competition was, uh, and it was very direct. And uh, I think about that a ton with Xbox One right now, because I think it's easy as you have some success in the 360 generation, and then you start to aspire to even to, to different, broader, more, to lose sight of what the core is of your yeah. product and what the customers think about. And yeah. I, I, I think back to those times, like you said, I still have my Voodoo install there. I still have my OG oh. Xbox dev kit, the clear one. It's still yep. sitting there in my office. Uh, because I think those days, that soul of what the team was about then uh, resonated in the product and the games that we put on the shelf. And well, pe people didn't the back then believe, I don't think that most business people, like in 1999, who weren't experienced in games, understood what a big market it was. Yeah. They didn't understand how passionate these people are. They didn't think of it as being an entertainment medium like on par with movies or music. No. They didn't, we all understood, because we were in it. We knew, we knew, so you could make promises. And I mean, you know, we, we promised anything that would help us that the Xbox would do. Oh, tune your television, for sure. We were lying. Yeah. We were lying, because we knew that if we just made it a game console, that it would, it would work, yeah. you know? And I think, you know, I don't know how you guys have managed it, but you kept it pure. I mean, I, I tell you, like the, the press conference, the, the briefing on Monday, you know, that was really pure. That was like, we Thanks. love games. That, and, yeah. and no, that was, an, an, that was awesome. Thanks. I was so impressed because I know a little bit about what it's like to maintain that focus on games, especially inside a big company where, you know, you can get pushed around a little bit and going out and saying, you know, we identify as gamers, and you guys identify as gamers, and we're here for you, and we're all about games, we're all about doing this. It yeah. was awesome. Well, I remember on the 360, and remember over, what were we at, the Red Lion in Bellevue or something? Sheridan. 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 War we were, Gaming? 
trying to figure, well, figuring out our memory. Like, was it 256 oh, no, no, no. or was it 512? It's a sailor's lodge. It's but weird. we're, yeah. you know, we're making a decision, which. Yeah, you're referring to the, the amount of RAM in the The console. amount of RAM yeah. in. Yeah. Because it all costs money. And yeah. yeah, and you start doing the math. Yeah. So you say you're going to sell 50, 70, 80, 100 million or whatever of the 360 console over the generation. Million and some very and, and high do- end hotel chains such as Red Lion where these meetings take place. <laughs> yeah. Very luxury resorts. Yeah, of course. But these- you're making these decisions, and we brought in Gears, right? Warfare yeah, at the yeah. time. And, and we had both uh, texture assets. And Peter's there. We're, we're looking at both games. And you're making the decision on how much RAM are you going to put in the box, which can turn out to be you know, hundreds of millions of dollars, the yeah. decision oh, over yeah. the life cycle yeah. of the box. And then we made the decision to go with 512. Yeah. And I think when we Best look back decision on that ever. decision, yeah, it's like... It, we, and then, we, we, uh, we were close to 256, well, so we couldn't afford 512. The plan was 256. Yeah. The plan was 256. Remember, you can't just yeah. think of it like you're putting a PC together. Like, it's a consumer device. It's the cost of the memory. It's the extra power. It's the cooling for the extra right, yeah. power. It's the UL yeah. certification for the cooling for the extra... I mean, like... And it will sit in that spec for 10 years. Yep. Right? It's yeah. not like you're going to be able to change it <laughs> halfway through the generation. And... I remember when we started seeing Gears as it came on, yeah. like it defined for us the HD generation of gaming. We first saw it. But those kind of decisions for us at the time were very much just driven by, we used the games as the canvas to look at what was going to be, what was going to create right. the best product. Yeah. Um, and it's a gutsy move and you got to go back up and, okay, sorry, we're going to have to increase the cost of the box. But, you know, getting driving decisions based on that kind of core yeah. of, What's going to make the best experience for the gamers? Peter, were you the guy? Isn't that, that weird, though? I'm starting to like, like you guys know this. So, um, and you know, I left Xbox and I did games like finance and stuff for like ten years. So I was all around funding games, like some of the like like Guitar Hero. Yeah. And um, no matter how many times people see that making the decision to make the game better is a better business, <laughs> and making the decision Always. to be cheaper yeah. isn't. Yeah. You still, like you, you every single time. time, you yeah, get that time. same decision. It's like people haven't figured out all these years. I know. What works is making a better game, making, yeah. it, making it more fun. It's, yeah. it's weird how you're always against the same. I know. People ask me now about how the indie does, and I say, good games sell, bad games don't. I mean, it's like anything else, right? It's just, that's... You, it's just that simple. Gotta, but yeah. there's no bad games, it's just bad price points, right? Eventually, <laughs> eventually... <laughs> that's a... Peter, the marketing the market is out about that. <laughs> eventually, they'll just move through. That's true. Peter, Sorry, right. Were but, you the guy that, that had to make that call on the ramp? Well, I mean, there did were that... bigger calls, and I think this was Salish Lodge, and, and, yeah. and Phil will remember this. Robbie Bach, who's, who's a great mentor to both of us, yeah. and was running the business, and, Ro- and both of us saw shout Robbie Shout out to today. Robbie Bach as well. Yeah. Yeah. And did this great thing in which we felt, I don't know, and this sounds ridiculous if you work in a real business, we had several billion dollars to spend <laughs> on launching the Xbox 360. Yeah. So if you remember, Robbie printed $100 million yeah. bills. Where are you going to spend $100 million bills printed, and we were in a room like this, <laughs> and it was, okay, mm. where are we going to spend these $100 million right. bills? And they were like Only at Microsoft. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so... So like marketing or game, ac- like studio all acquisitions, All of the that kind P&L of thing. verticals, so the cost of the hardware, the cost of marketing, go get third-party games, right? 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 Yeah. Go get this. And, and it was a simple process. You've got N billion dollars to spend, <laughs> And we moved them around, and in the end, we got this right balance of we're going to spend this to make the game, uh, to make the platform 512, and but that took away money from third party. Yeah. MGS, Microsoft Game Studios, needed to start driving Halo. We needed to go get Epic and, and Mark Rain and Cliffy B yeah. and Tim Sweet. Because Halo wasn't ready for launch. Well, we needed Gears. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and what worked out well is. Epic needed a platform for the Unreal Engine 3. Right. Mm-hmm. Right? On consoles. Yeah. On yeah. consoles yeah. And, gear, and it all came together like a yeah. perfect storm. And there's no visual aid like cash. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> but right. I can see us now, and I, I yeah. don't think it took us two days, and, and George Peckham, who, who ran still Third there. Party, and still there, and what George. do we do, go get this from EA and Ubisoft and Activision, and in the end, we got the right balance mm-hmm. of where we're going to spend our money. Yeah. Yeah, this, this may sound weird, all these billions of dollars, but the one thing to keep in mind, okay, so you, you, you run Xbox. Or you're looking, I remember distinctly, and this might have been a Robbie thing, I remember distinctly sitting in some annual P&L at Microsoft, right? And at that point, it probably, well, you were running 360, okay? The guy next to you, whoever at the time is running Microsoft Office, he is running, literally, no joke, the most profitable business in the history of mankind. Yeah. Wow. 
So here you are, and you're like, oh, you know, sweating it because, you know, you're like a billion dollars. You're like, Jesus, it's a billion. He doesn't even notice a billion dollars. Yeah. <laughs> it's lost in the couch. Yeah. yeah. And so coming out of this first squeaky little brand and saying, no, it's, you know, it's a game console and it's going to be the future was downright weird for a long period of time. And that's the context in which you live when you're, when you're operating this business. Yeah. So Seamus, you left Microsoft, I believe, in 2003. Is that correct? Two, right. two or three or something right crazy now. So what I'm curious of is, uh, did you have any ideas yourself for a second Xbox? You know, which obviously, you know, you, you left the company, but I'm just kind of curious if, if you ever had anything rolling around in your head for what a, what a, a second machine would look like. Well, no, you know, I, I, I really thought about it the entire time exactly like I used to talk about it, which was, um, you know, I thought about the hardware as putting enough stuff in there that had the potential to change things and make new kinds of stuff. And I think the same thing about the business. Like, here you have Microsoft backing games, you know? And for me, that, that felt like a really big victory, you know? It really, really did. And I started to get uh, freaked out about the fact that a lot of my friends couldn't get, no matter how much we did with Xbox, you know, friends of mine, like Tim, who later got signed by Microsoft and then unsigned, but, you know, guys like that, at that point, getting funding to make an original game was almost impossible. And I just loved games and I couldn't do anything to get them funded. And it occurred to me that all that training from sitting through the PL meetings might actually be helpful <laughs> doing some funding. And you know, it never occurred to me that Xbox would do anything except eventually take over Microsoft. It really didn't. I thought, okay, there it goes. Like Microsoft will become Xbox at some point. I probably thought it would happen sooner than that. Getting now. there. Yeah. yeah. We're on our way. So when I, I see when I see takeover. Windows taking, you know, Xbox design cool. points and mm -hmm. UI points and stuff like that, I I'm like I have a personal happy moment. You should. You should. Phil, what do you think is the biggest difference between Xbox now and Xbox back in the early days, either from like a cultural standpoint or from uh, or just how you see it maybe or how anything. Open ended question. And again, I thought Seamus put it well that the, the origins of Xbox were as much about proving we could do something and that there's this space that to many, both externally and internally, we didn't belong as Microsoft with the game console. The, I'd say that, and that was fun because bootstrapping something like that and kind of just proving against the ether of, of we've never been there before uh, has its own unknown challenges and you just kind of go tackle. But interesting. Weirdly enough, though, like the Microsoft mantra of like software enabling things, there's probably no purer expression of that than games. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, weirdly, I think in some sense, you know, just like you think the only good purpose of a computer is to play games, like mm -hmm. some sense, like the only good purpose of a software company is eventually to make games. Yeah. You know? And the, today, we're kind of more front and center in the company. And we went through a time in the 360. Whereas you said, sitting next to the office team or somebody else, you're kind of trying to define your relevance. And your numbers are an order of magnitude smaller than the other numbers, but you're talking about fan kind of uh, passion for your sure. brand and other things. And you know, Satya was in the audience this year mm -hmm. at E3. Last yeah. time was Bill in, what, 07 for Live Anywhere. Was That's the last right. Time. Yeah. I nope. think we Live had the CEO in the, in the audience. Satya was there. Terry Meyerson was there. Our head of marketing was there. And, the, the company is, is definitely very serious about what we're trying to do with gaming and consumer. And it's, there, there are unique challenges in, in that world of now people do pay attention to what your product roadmap looks like over the 12 months. Nobody really looked at the P&L of Azure, right? It was just, now we're gonna do this blue guy game. And yeah. now people wanna know, okay, this ReCore game, what is it? Why <laughs> yeah. is it interesting? Who is this Inafune-san guy? And why are we signing a game Recore with ReCore looks really cool, but It does, I'm wearing the shirt today. And yeah. it's, uh, and it's gonna be a fantastic game, we're playing it. But it's, you know, the, getting the support of the company is a great thing. Being more front and center and hearing Xbox show up in the earnings calls from Amy Hood, the CFO, and she, she knows our live engagement numbers and she's talking to analysts about it. It's all fantastic and it's great for the brand and it's great for the team. Uh, but it also has a certain amount of just kind of visibility that you need to live up to. Right. Um, so would you rather be left alone like back in the original Xbox days? No, because I... Well, we were I, left alone. I don't understand where you get that concept from. But, <laughs> but okay, have that fantasy. What are you talking about the sort of the garage mentality? <laughs> you know, with Seamus' point... It was I, a garage with a lot of people peeking in the window. Yeah. Right? <laughs> but the, what we've done in, in, in a way, I'll, 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 I'll kind of take it away from gaming. 
what we've been able to do in fostering, and think about the briefing on Monday. We have 500 fans there. We announced backward compatibility. I literally thought the roof was gonna come off the place, right? I mean, you were there, it yeah, was, it was yeah, crazy. Yeah. And the, how many Microsoft consumer products would get that reception today, right? And we wish there were 10. <laughs> the surface. Like last time it was Windows 95, yeah, right? And That's true. So I don't, as somebody who's been at the company and thinks we have something to offer, not only in console gaming and gaming and Windows gaming and, and, and more broadly, I think what we've learned in doing Xbox and building that can apply. I call it the reverse takeover inside the company. Like I think there are things that we can, the Windows Insider program came from Xbox Preview, right? They looked at us with our flighting program. They said, hey, we should get Windows people signed up for Windows before it ships. Uh, and there are other places where people are looking at what we're doing. I, so I, I don't want to go back to a, a kind of, I don't say more isolated is probably the wrong way to put it. Um, because I think it's it's good for the company in the long run. I, th I think it's it's good for gamers especially because we're taking a broader view of of what the company can do in this space. Peter, uh, take me back to your memories of the 360 launch. Uh, is it, you know, you, you mentioned you wanted to be first, uh, yeah. but you're going into the HD era. You're, the PS2 is still this incredibly dominant piece yep. of hardware that you guys have specifically targeted as the thing we want to beat. That uh, it hurt my Dreamcast. That, it was yes, personal. yes, that, that uh, it definitely. It was personal. So, Emotion I mean, engine, Toy <laughs> Story. So are you nervous to launch when, when Xbox 360 is launching or just excited, can't wait to I get just, it out there? I'm curious. This awesome view of you as a manga character with like the tears <laughs> and a gun in each hand. <laughs> you hurt my dream yeah, cast. That's right. Yeah. No, I, I, what we, well, first of all, we need to get a name for the darn thing and then we needed to get the spec right and then we needed to get the controller right and then we need to get the marketing right and we need to position it. And it needs to be positioned in a unique way. And I always remember the line, we had a great, very talented agency, I'm sure still there, McCann Erickson, that, mm -hmm. that helped us with. But then we also brought in um, tone agency. So a lot of when you do marketing, you've got to get the positioning right. The line we came up with, that the Xbox 360 is a living entertainment experience right. powered by human energy. Now that may sound like marketing BS to you, but that was the mantra we had. Mm -hmm. And the human energy was eventually manifested itself in a thing called Xbox Live. Yeah, right. But this living entertainment experience was for the first time it was gonna be bigger than games. Games at the core, but it was gonna play music and eventually we, you, know, you could play your movies on it. And this was the difference there. We needed to get out first, we needed to get our price point right, we needed yeah. to get our launch portfolio powerful, broad, spread across. We needed to get away from being a shooter box which was a challenge. We needed to be more inviting, so we came up with a tagline called Jump In. Mm -hmm. We did three incredible TV spots, one of which never, never made the air. Yeah. Really? Which yeah. still I'm bitter well, about. Well, so what was that? It's called Standoff. <laughs> People shooting You would have seen it. <laughs> and uh, Jen Martin just snickered. I know she did right there. No, but it was, we filmed this in, in a railway station in Buenos Aires, and you'll see it on YouTube. And it was basically this concept of the purity of play, which is, if you don't have anything to play with, you, you use your fingers, and mm -hmm. it's cops and robbers. Yeah. And it was set in this train station. Guy goes up, talks to somebody, they stare at each other, and there's this sense of tension, and then there's a pause, and he goes like that. And the entire cast in the train station plays like we did kids, whether it's cowboys and Indians, cops and robbers, and it was probably an unfortunate time where it was perceived as violence, I think there was a Madrid train station bombing, which was probably the wrong time for this. But it looks innocuous today. Mm. But it was, it, it set us apart. I also then remember the E3 when, God bless, Kazarai and Jack Trenton announced 599 and we were all backstage. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Throwing we a party. Were, and we knew, we, we knew then we had the opportunity to get ahead, drive ahead, get our games out quickly and get that lead. And I always said the first of 10 million. <laughs> you, had, you had the backlash on that two years ago, didn't <laughs> you? Didn't you know, I know some. the opposite yeah. feeling there. <laughs> yeah. Got to be there first, get yeah. there. First of 10 million wins, Listen to what Peter, I always believe. Talk about all this like incredibly smart media strategy and hiring firms. And I'm just, I'm feeling like a 12 year old. I'm like, cause we had a green pen. <laughs> it was a green pen and you know. It's cheaper. Like, yeah, no, but, but it, was, it was a great time. It was one of the greatest times of my career. You had to corral, you had to build a team because we were we were growing then. Yeah. We had we had prematurely put the Xbox to sleep, yep. and we needed to get ready for this. And we knew what we needed mm. to do. And I alluded to a little. We had a three-day meeting at the Sheraton in Bellevue. Mm. And we war-gamed the scenario, and I actually played Ken Kutaragi. 
<laughs> and we, we brought in a consultancy. Yep. It, was, it was a lot of fun. And the one thing we've forgotten about, and if you remember this, Phil, we completely discounted Nintendo. Yep. Because they came off the wow. GameCube and it was a disaster. And they destroyed it, both of us. <laughs> yes, with the Wii. <laughs> and, but we war gamed for three days. What are you going to do? What do the launch titles look like? What are the marketing budgets? What are the positioning? And it was a fascinating experience, which I'll never forget. And this, is, this is a decade ago. Yeah. Um, and I actually played Ken Kudaragi. And my job was to destroy the launch of the Xbox 360. Interesting. Uh, well, I think about Zero Hour and all zero of those hour. things around the Zero line. Hour. We, out in the Mojave six Desert. Six weeks out, we thought, let's, let's go celebrate with our players. Yeah. yeah. David Reed was in yeah. marketing. Jay and I went out there. Do you remember the fact that we found people with weapons uh -huh. in the line? Yeah. yeah we, we had some issues there. <laughs> uh, but it was a celebration with the fans. If you don't know what it was, we, we rented some airplane hangars. We in brought in Best Buy. It was <laughs> in the middle of nowhere. We put thousands of beanbags out there. There were Xbox 360 interactives. We had our launch titles, probably Cameo, Perfect Dark, yeah. and, um, certainly Gears of War. PGR3, maybe. PGR, Project PGR, Gotham yeah. Racing yeah. from Bizarre Creations. Sorry. And you just were allowed to sit there and just play. And I can still see, and it was the fantastic. desert had this green, your green cool. marker glow. There's Horace Luke. It was like Area 51. Marker. It was fabulous. Yeah. So yeah, was you mentioned, Peter, of, uh, of you know, doing the woohoo when when you heard 599, 599 from from Sony, but I mean you you did an admirable job of navigating the 360. Through, now everybody, the 360 was a great console and everybody remembers it so fondly and still does. But you navigated the company through the red ring of death mm. scenario. Mm. Uh, what, mm. what? <laughs> when did you realize it was bad? Was it sort of like a sudden thing, like oh no, no or was no, it sort of a gradual no, like? It wasn't sudden. It was building over weeks, and Todd Hamdahl, who yeah. was a great guy. Still at Microsoft. And still at Microsoft. And, and super and brilliant hardware engineer. And, super and guy. One of the tallest men, I think, very living tall. today. Very tall guy. No. <laughs> That's immaterial to the story, but very tall. Uh, we were seeing, and Phil well, remembers this. None of these guys we, know. We were, seeing, Todd. <laughs> we were seeing failure rates and starting to get reports through customer service yeah. and stuff and so if you don't have, know that the must have killed Todd because he's a really nice guy to and this day works to really Todd's hard. Todd's credit this day every time I see him he comes up and yeah. apologizes to me. It's been a long time and I don't know what he's apologizing for because I took a lot of the abuse because I was the face of it and Todd says it was ultimately on me but this was a thing that we actually couldn't figure out what was going on. For those who don't remember what happened when, it, when, it, when the box bricked and died you get Actually, three rings, if three I remember. Three red lights. Right. Yeah, yes. we're there. And the, 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 that was fine, and we knew we had a problem. And I always remember going to Robbie Bach, uh, my boss, and saying, I think we could have a billion dollar problem here. Uh, as we started to do the analysis of what was going on, we were getting the defectives in. It was a challenging problem for our engineers. Couldn't quite figure out what it was. We knew it was heat related. And, and there were all kinds of fixes. Remember, people put the wet towel towels trick, around yeah. the box. Yeah. Yeah. All the and fans then and everything. The moment I'll never forget, and Phil, I don't know if you're in this meeting, I said to Robbie, we've got a, uh, what's known as a business review meeting uh, in Building 34 mm -hmm. with Steve. Oh, how fun. Balmer. And it was our normal review. I said, we've got to tell Steve we're going to need to, here's what we had to do. We need to FedEx an empty box to a customer that had a problem. They would call us up yep. with a FedEx return label yeah. to send your box, and then we would FedEx it back to them and fix it. Either keep your hard drive, or, or send it to us. Yeah. And I calculated with my finance team, Dennis Durkin, Doug Ralphs, uh, Dennis now the CFO at Activision, yeah. uh, $1.15 billion. Right out there. Well, I always remember $240 million of that was FedEx. <laughs> Their stock must have gone through the roof for the next two weeks. <laughs> and I am trembling, sat in front of Steve, who I love to death, but he can be an intimidating human being. <laughs> and Steve said, okay, talk me through this. I said, if we, don't, if we don't do this, this brand is dead. This is a Tylenol moment. Now, for those of you that aren't as old as me, what, if you remember, Tylenol was killing people. And Johnson & Johnson took every package of Tylenol off the shelf and, and went out of business for six weeks. And, and those of you that take it for granted, the security seals Seal. on drugs, that was a Tylenol moment. If you don't remember, people, somebody never found was putting cyanide on Tylenol, and people were dying overnight mm -hmm. in Chicago. This was a Tylenol moment. 
Steve looked at me and said, what are we going to do? I said, we've got we to take them all back and we've got to do this in a first class way. It's got to be, because you take a console away from a, from a gamer and you're going to spend three weeks fixing it. They'd rather have poison Tylenol. They, yeah, well, I'm not sure about that. But, 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 but it's the worst. So we've got to FedEx this all the way. We've got an overnight it back in two. He said, what's it going to cost? And I, and I always remember taking a deep breath, looking at Robbie and going, we think it's $1.15 billion, Steve. He said, do it. Hmm. it there, was not, there was no hesitation. And I'm thinking, I'm about to create a Microsoft stock. <laughs> Yeah, Actually, the, nothing moved. The but. thing about all those guys, every time there was tension like that that I can remember, you'd be really scared of them, and then eventually you realize the only thing to be scared of with Steve and Bill Gates and all those guys was being full of If you were full of you were dead. Mm -hmm. Well, particularly If you were Bill. honest yeah. and you brought the problem, it was, okay, how can we help you? Yeah. And that's why that business was so but great. But I, I will never forget that moment, I will, and I will always thank, if you're an Xbox gamer, you can thank Steve Ballmer for yeah. not even hesitating. Now. We were a wealthy company and could afford to do that. Sure. But not even hesitating because the brand was more important. If we hadn't made that decision there and then and tried to fudge over this problem, then the Xbox brand and Xbox One wouldn't exist today. What was that week like for you personally? I mean, would, like, could you think about anything? Could you function? Was it like... It was sickening because, uh, you know, you, you, I was doing a lot of interviews and it's not like today with social media, which it would have been horrific, but we were trying to figure out, we, 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 we couldn't figure it out. And there was a theory, I always remember, that we had changed our soda, which is the way that you put mm -hmm. your GPU and the fans, right. to lead-free. And Todd, who was the most sincere human being, was going crazy trying to figure it out. And we knew it was heat-related, and we think it was drying out. Somehow the heat that was coming off the GPU was drying out some of the soda. And it wasn't the normal stuff that we've used because we had to meet European standards and take the lead out. And, and, and I'd left since, and I'm not sure it was ever, fit. I'm sure it was in the end. Mm -hmm. but well, the dye shrink sort of more or less eventually yeah. took care of the problem. Yeah, yeah. Right. oh no, yeah, yeah. And, and, and go cool things off, that takes care of a lot of problems. Yeah. But, but it was less about that, it was that moment of decision that Steve Ballmer made that I will never forget, yeah. that didn't even think twice about spending 1.15 billion to protect a brand that's probably worth three or four times that today. <laughs> True. Because sure. Xbox One wouldn't have happened. Right. No, it was dark days. Oh, Seamus, on, on a similar note of, of uh, sort of big decisions, did any bean counters or anybody try to talk you out of shipping uh, a console that had a then useless, more or less useless, useless Ethernet port? I mean, you could use it for System Link, but, you know, Xbox Live was just this thing you were going to do down the road. Did part anybody go, you shouldn't, well, let's not put that in there. Part of this job one. is the line of bean counters out your door trying to talk you out of everything that's cool. <laughs> that and the hard drive were totally new. And, you know, there'd been a failed experiment over at Sega with, you know, with some online play, right. even in a football game. And a football game can't even carry online play. None of these, none of these kids want to play online. And meanwhile, you know, anybody knew anything, in which, you know, about games, which involved, you know, everyone working on Xbox and all our friends and every game designer we ever knew saw this phenomenon exploding on the PC. Mm -hmm. Exploding. And the only thing holding back online gaming was the fact that you essentially had to be a hobbyist and know how to set up a PC and, and the network connections in order to, to play. But anybody who had a friend who had that setup would go play and they would never stop playing. So again, just like games being really obvious to us, this was a big market, and if you just, you know, if you just get it over the line, you'll be okay. Same thing was obviously true with online games, obviously true. And the problem doesn't stop with the hardware cost, of the ethernet, or that engineering, that, that only begins. The problem then extends to everything we had to do with all the internet service providers, all the infrastructure, all the ways that firewalls had been set up and latency and gateways and ping and security and all of that had to be worked out, literally worked out one at a time with mm -hmm. all of those guys to make it work. And people forget that now because now the internet of the entire world is essentially optimized for online games. This is no joke. Yeah. It's not optimized even for porn anymore like it is optimized for online games. That is what it is optimized to do because that makes everything better and faster that you could possibly do online. But there was a time when you'd have a conversation with a, you know, a Comcast and they'd say, what, games? No, what the, the, this is probably not secure. What is, what is it, 14 year olds? No, it's a big well, business. Were you confident that live was gonna work? Because what people forget is, 
Live didn't ship, Xbox Live didn't launch until a year after the console. It was just this sort of thing that was promised. I remember we wrote about it in OXM, like, oh, Xbox Live is coming. Let's go back and look at the old news stories about the skepticism about yeah. that. Mm -hmm. and, and now it seems really obvious. It's really interesting. And it was this broadband only service yeah. in a 56K dial up age. So were you guys, did you, what, what were these sort of expectations for uh, the, the attach rate, for, for how people wouldn't take to Xbox Live? Were there even subscription goals, you, or was it you, just, we just need to get this out there? When you start something like this, okay, there are two, two things that happen, if you're really honest with, it, with yourself. The first thing is, you need to really passionately believe in it, and it really helps if you're in the target audience, so that you know if the thing you're making, if you would buy it, then you're in pretty good shape, so you start there. Then you make up a ton of numbers, and, and you lie to management about the size of the market. You say, <laughs> in the best possible world, and you can't do this when you have a mature business, because there's track, there's th there are numbers of track. Sure. Okay, but you know, when it's brand new, and you just believe in it, right? If you believe in it enough, you make up the best possible scenario that could ever happen, and projection, and you make sure that you have a demo, and you have at least one customer out there, some ISP somewhere, somewhere in the world, where it's gonna work, and it's gonna be flawless, and you test it, you make sure that it's flawless, and then you go and you say it's gonna work just like this everywhere. And it was true. But, boy, you know, it was not obvious at the time. It really, really, really wasn't. Like, we, can you imagine, can you imagine even sitting in front of any computing device that doesn't have a broadband connection anymore? No. Okay. No, they're in our phones. And, and when, the, when the first Xbox came out, like that was a novelty, right? You know, yeah, yeah. it was a novelty. It wasn't even really the case yet. Like now, and for, you know, since maybe 2002 or 2003, if you set something in front of a computer that doesn't have an internet connection, it's uncomfortable, it's weird. It's not quite clear what you're gonna do, right? For all of history up until then, people never had a connection. Right. And so that was a big moment. Phil, on the software side, yeah. on the original Xbox, were there any uh, game cancellations back then that that uh, you really wished had gotten seen released? I mean, you know, I always I always uh, politely nudge you about you know those was True Fantasy Live Online and BC yeah. were the were the two biggies. But were there any games uh, that that never made it that you wow, always had a soft fantasy. spot for? Well, Level five. I've told the yeah. story a few times about passing on the original Guitar Hero. They're great. So obviously that's a decision I regret, given what that turned into. Uh, there was a game called Citizen Zero. Oh, yeah. That was a first-person shooter MMO. And now with umpteen hundred hours into Destiny, you know, I look <laughs> back and uh, our box became defined by shooters early on, the yeah. success of Halo and, and Gears and Call of Duty and things. And that's a game that if I, th I think if we would have stuck with it, I'm trying to remember developed in Australia. I don't even remember the name of the developer. Uh, actually, my first day in Microsoft Studios, I had to cancel a game called Knights of Decaden with uh, Larry Holland. You remember Larry Holland? Larry. Yeah. Oh. And it was just a game that wasn't working for either of us, so it wasn't like a... a, 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 a Did it have a colon, situation. though, with another thing? <laughs> it was, no, it was just Knights of Decaden. It was 3D Joust, and don't build 3D Joust. It doesn't work. You can't, without lock-on, you can't hit anybody. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, Citizen Zero, free-to-play, or not free-to-play, we didn't know what free-to-play was, but uh, a first-person shooter MMO, TFLO, would have been a good one. You know, free to play right after you buy it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, Mythica Ooh. is a game that we yeah. canceled, which was an internal big uh, MMO, mm -hmm. uh, which was ambitious on our part. We had done Asheron's Call, and that's we right. were looking at, at Mythica. That was actually a PC game. Uh, but I assume if we would have kept with it, we would have ended up on console. You know, in, in hindsight, what you do, I think, is you look back at models that worked, and you see your ideas that were kind of precursors to things that worked. And you know, even when I look at like Viva Pinata now, because I'm playing it with Back Compat, and Viva Pinata is very much a free-to-play game. And it was just wrapped inside. Oh, if, Viva, if Viva Pinata had come out on iPad like five years later, it would have been like number one. Cute. That's right. Crazy. But we had to fix killing the worms, because nobody wanted to name their worm and then feed your worm to the bird, right? That was the, the flaw in the game, was when my daughters would name their worms, and then, and then you'd have them. to explain the, the circle of life, and that the worms needed to be sacrificed <laughs> in order to attract the birds, and we, we should have had some other way of attracting the higher, higher up. But 
Uh, but yeah, you know, you, you can go back and you can look at ideas that now work and smarter people than I am uh, were able to take things over the finish line. And that's, that's been, you kind of have to define, especially in the game business, you've got to define what you do. Yeah. Because there's a thousand things you could have, should have, would have done. Yeah. Uh, and especially as a gamer, like if you, if you're actually a gamer and you, and you get these pitches and you're like all day, like, you know, for days and you just want them all. Yeah. You just want to play them all. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, you love game developers and they're your friends and you want everybody to succeed and it's, it's total misery to have to decide. It's totally yeah. miserable because you just want to play everything. Like what there's, you're, I mean, you were exactly right. There's, there's no bad games. There are games that maybe aren't done or that have a problem or something, but like, you know, just getting to play a game yeah. and having it be your job, like nothing's better than My that. My PR guy today, he pitched me and he wants to do, he, he wants, uh, don't, do, just don't out his idea, man. No, yeah. no, Red Links. He wants <laughs> trials with snowboarding. And I said, you know, that makes sense. Like, you can play snowboarding inside. That's Work. a good idea. Maybe somebody... Yeah, so we should guess ten, 10 minutes from now, five of those will be released on Android. <laughs> we should go use our Amped IP. Remember Amped? Amped. Yeah. Amped. We could load some SSX. Snowboarding. I, 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 tell you what, I remember, I remember Dark Summit. Yeah. Um, launch game. Yeah. Uh, Seamus, was there anything you really wanted the original Xbox to do that for one reason or another it ended up not happening? Like either Be profitable? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> um, something that I wanted to do that didn't do. Um, honestly, I wanted it to be successful in Japan. I really yeah. did. I really thought that, and I spent a lot of time in Japan and worked really hard in Japan because I love Japanese games, and at, at that point, you know, so much of the innovation in the games industry had come from Japan and been yeah. defined by Japan. And that was really important to me. And that would have required it, though, be smaller than a Japanese apartment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it would have you couldn't get the controller the or the box? Yeah. Both oh. The, oh, the controller. <laughs> it would have required a lot, a, of, a lot of, of things, is, man. Yeah. You know, if it would have fit I'm in an apartment block. Japan. It would have taken the power down in the apartment block, too. But, no, the, I, I really, uh, I had this, I had, I had deluded myself that it could be successful there. You know, the main reason we spent so much time in Japan was to get the content so that we could have yeah, Japanese right. games. Because you couldn't succeed at the time Ninja without Gaiden. Japanese games. Ninja Gaiden. Yeah. Uh, Sakaguchi. Well, yeah. And uh, Peter Green all of Lost those guys. Odyssey, Blue Lost Dragon. Odyssey. He's yeah. just going to bring Dragon. those up. Yeah. And, and, and plus, those are his scars. He's talking about Getting to meet those <laughs> guys. Scars. Getting to go to Meguro and Naka Meguro and like see Sega and all those guys. And... And, Spent a lot know, of time doing that. To meet all those people, that was great, amazing for me. And then, you know, just like it was everything about it was wrong for Japanese consumers. And it felt, it felt like a joke then, but I really wanted it. And I can, I can distinctly remember going to the first Tokyo Game Show when we were out. And I flew there later or something because I had some sort of commitment. And uh, me and Kevin Backus, from the original four guys, got on the train because Tokyo Game Show is not even anywhere near Tokyo. Chiba. You, take, you go to Chiba City on the, on the subway. And we got on the subway, and there were Xbox banners everywhere. And we just started to cry. We couldn't handle it because we're in a foreign country. And the, 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 our joke, our in-joke, our inside joke is like on posters everywhere. And it started to get in our heads that maybe we could be successful in Japan now. Well, you guys made, I mean, the two of you in particular, Peter and Phil, you guys made a hell of an effort with, no, I'm being, I'm being serious. I mean. Lost Odyssey, Blue Dragon, uh, you got some third parties, I mean, Tales of Vesperia, yep. uh, Eternal Sonata. Mm -hmm. You guys made a hell of a push. I mean, you you can't say that oh, there's a whole thing. You guys I did mean, not try. We're talk about Red, Red Ring of Death. On the original Xbox, I remember we had a huge crisis in Japan that some consumers thought that their discs were being slightly damaged, slightly mm -hmm. scratched. By the You're talking about the Xbox. Thompson yeah. Uh, yeah. disk drive? Oh, and, 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 and I like think that's there was a the little, level of there care. There was a little bit of an industrial espionage going on there. Uh, because maybe. because there was be a right. little, oh, I totally believe there was. Maybe anyway, right. we'll leave that alone. Maybe we should have a scotch over that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what's everybody's favorite 360 game? That's easy. Oh, oh yeah, here's Gears. The, the first time we covered a third of your screen with the back of Marcus Phoenix so that you would see the resolution of our textures in high definition. Yeah, uh, I think the TV yeah. ad. I mean, listen, that that was that was a big moment in marketing. That was that awesome. was mad, mad world as mad world. hell. Yeah, that was a big. We deal. almost ran it this E3. We talked about it with Gears Four with Rod on stage, who was our Microsoft producer on early Gears, um, and we were going to go back to Mad World because it's just that was such. You know, I think about Starry Night with uh, sure with Halo. Halo. 3. Yeah, uh, but. 
you know, the Mad World ad uh, really put Marcus as a character. You know, it's, there's really not a lot of shooting in the ad. He kind of ends up in the warehouse, uh, and but that's the end. But it just was a very I think for thoughtful. a lot of people, that moment was the first time that a video game character, because mm-hmm. it was this huge, you know, this huge shooter video game character yeah. was a real character right there. And that... Uh, just the music is with great. Cliff and, and Tim Sweeney, Cliff Blazinski, and everybody that we got to work with on Gears. And it, it meant so much to us in the generation, because... We were going four by three, 16 by nine, standard def, high def, and it was really what game can we put out? Perfect Dark Zero didn't really turn out to be a game that was gonna show it. COD at launch was great, but it had launched on PC like a couple months before. That's true. So it, it was great, on, but it wasn't kind of an original console game. And Gears was later, right? It didn't hit right. launch. Uh, but we were able to you show fight, it before. You had Fight Night in Oblivion. Fight Night, were... kudos to notice Fight Night from uh, EA Chicago when he was there. Yeah. Uh, and I remember the face animations and stuff. It was Steve great. Steve and Bill on stage at CES. Yeah. And Steve threw the controller across the stage. <laughs> and I but, had to tell him off after that. You don't throw controllers on the floor. But Gears to me, yeah. and the gameplay I thought was fantastic. It sold incredibly well. It's still on our stage, which you know means something. And that was just great. How about you, Peter? Favorite 360 game? Well, let me just finish the yeah. Gears story. Sure. I'll never forget the moment, to Phil and Seamus' point, when the agency pitched me Mad World, which was a song from Donnie Darko, mm-hmm. a Tears yeah. for Fears song. And usually when you get pitched by an agent with the creative, come on in, there's boards, or there's what we call Rippomatics or mm-hmm. Animatics. What all they did, so there's a conference room, which I spent a ton of time in, in Millennium B, 1216. Yes, we did. 1216. Yeah, I know that room. <laughs> and they came in, and it was a little uncomfortable. He said, we're gonna switch the lights off. There's like 25 guys in this room. <laughs> I'm going to switch the lights off. I'm going to play you a song, and I want you to imagine Marcus Phoenix facing a boss battle towards the end in which it doesn't end well. And when that music played, this was, this was a, a, a watershed moment in video game marketing because everything else was hard rock, yeah, and, yeah. and it was more like the Black Sabbath or Metallica or ACDC. And fast cuts, there was no emotion. There was no passion. They turn the lights off. I can still hear the music. Turn the lights back on. I looked at Harris, one of the, one of the creators, says, this is it. The other thing about that was that, that we wanted to do just CGI. Because you actually, that commercial, that, you can't play that in the game. Right. Mm-hmm. You can't play that in the game. And I got very squeamish that it was going to be pure CGI. And I said, we've got to do this in engine. Yep. This has got to be in engine. And ILM was doing it. Mm-hmm. And I always remember it cost us $600,000 more to give them dev kits and get it to, in UE. to get it in engine. So I could stand up and say, this is in engine. Now, you'll never play that scene, yeah. but this is in engine and that. But back to the story. So I spent 60 days in B1216 demoing for the media two games. That was my life from March 1st through April 28th, 2005. Gears of War. Cameo. Cameo. I was playing Cameo today. And for that reason, Cameo, yeah. Yeah. to me, was a gorgeous game. Still holds up. And Underappreciated. Yeah. Oh, totally under. And I remember getting into an argument with Dan Shu with Shu about the rating, and I wanted it re-reviewed. <laughs> I thought it was just a gorgeous game. But it showed off what that box could do. Yeah, great character. Right? Was it a great game? No, but it was Anything you need, sometimes you need a killer app that shows off graphics. The, I can still see the colors. Remember the palace up in the cloud? Oh, the palace, and, yeah, and I yeah. took Cameo through the gardens yeah. or whatever. When you, you get a little, when you do it 150 times, you get a little tired of the whole sure. thing. But Cameo <laughs> still today would be my favorite Xbox 360 game. Good. Yeah. Who at the table has the highest gamer score? Not me. Is it, oh, I'm seeing the, the showdown going. No, no. <laughs> uh, the problem with, with and I, I've said this before, is I play so much on dev kits yeah, I'm, that then I, I go back, what am I at now? I'm, I'm 30,000, 26,000, something like that. Nothing math, massive. Uh, I probably have more hours, as we know, into Destiny than most people. Yeah. Uh, but, <laughs> uh, well. you know, it's, I play games four or five nights a week. You guys see me online. I mean, absolutely. It's, it's uh, absolutely. It's what I grew up doing. It's what I love doing. It's a, uh, great part of the, the industry. I like actually playing the smaller games and figuring out what people are trying to do that's creative and yeah. new. 
And that's where so many of the ideas come from. Yeah. You know, sitting down with the Cuphead guys and that's going through what they're trying to get done. Still, it's one of the most popular games. It's, at the, yeah, at the man. Steady Cuphead. Three. Yeah. Those guys. It's crazy hard. Just so we're clear. It's crazy Good. hard right Good. now. It's like, okay, we got to turn down. We got to make it a little bit easier. But uh, great game. But uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, playing games is what I do. So we're starting to wind down. We've got a few more minutes. What, Phil, what did you think when you saw, well, both and Seamus, what did you think when you guys saw the episode of South Park that lampooned that man? Because <laughs> he's it's a, a cultural <laughs> icon. Yeah, I think, I think. I was proud to know yeah. him and say I could call him a friend. Crack Baby Basketball Associates. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Still at the header, the header image on your Twitter. Uh, it is, uh, yes, and I have one of my proudest artifacts of, of that period is, is Matt Stone and Trey Parker signing the cells, the original cells of the nice. game, which That's I have. Awesome. And, and the tagline of, get the heck out of my, yeah. <laughs> that. that was a weird 24 hours. Did, did, you, did you have any clue before None that? at all. Yeah. I always remember as a New Hampshire, I was on a board um, uh, of a company called Timberland, if everybody's worn yeah. their Tims. And my son, Tyler, who works at IGN, mm -hmm. calls me, didn't realize I was on the East Coast, and said, you were just on South Park. This was <laughs> 2, 2 a.m. in New Hampshire. Yeah. I said, and, and, and we've been lampooned because of Tiger Woods in the past and EA Sports involved. I said, when you say you, you mean EA Sports, right? He said, no, you. <laughs> and, and he said, but it was weird. You were more like Boss Hog than some guy from Liverpool, which obviously my son knows I am. And, and I, t I found it online the next morning, and it, and, and it just blew up. And it was, if, if you haven't seen it, the idea was that the boys in the South Park boys had figured out that there were crack babies in the uh, maternity ward, and they were to train them to play basketball. And the business model was to go to EA Sports and get a video game <laughs> license to watch babies that were addicted to crack. And man, I'm sorry, this is South Park to play basketball. <laughs> and, and, and they got a frosty reception from me as part but, of that. Wait, I want, but on the Peter, just talking, it'll be weird because he's sitting right here. But the, you know, the original Xbox was, I'll just say, at, at the top, kind of Ed and Jay under yeah. Robbie. And we went through a time where Ed left and Jay went off to do Zune. Zune. And you know, Peter, Peter Moore took Stepped the up. business at a time when it wasn't obvious that we were going to continue in the business. And put together Bet on Shane. Yeah. Uh, you know, as on the studio side, Shane Kim. And took the business Good through bet. into the yeah. 360 generation. Uh, at, a, at a time when I said it wasn't obvious that the company was going to continue to do that. He did that with real executive leadership. Uh, he connected with the team, which I think is why fans love him. And you can, you can put him on our stage, which I love having him on our stage. And he connects, but you can also put him in front of Bill and Steve. And he shows up sure. as a leader that they respect and trust to make billion dollar decisions on continuing the brand. So and a, a Peter is, I know it's a lot about the origin and kind of some about now, but in our history, I don't think there's, there's anybody that deserves more credit for us continuing in where we are today, because we went through this transition in some hard times, and Peter, as a leader, really stood up and, and managed both the team, the brand, the community, and got us through it. And like all of us, just it's, it's great. It's great Thank what you, you did. Um, I, I consider him a friend, and seeing him on South Park makes me laugh. <laughs> uh, but it's, uh, it, it's great. It's great to be sitting here with him, and just like what he's meant to Xbox yeah, is no, tremendous. He really doesn't Bill. always get as much credit he's, as he there, there are very few marketing people in any business who, who talk about themselves as marketing people, who are honest and who are a part of the demographic they market to in a genuine way, and who stick with it. I mean, he mentioned other guys who had been on Xbox and then left. You know, there were a lot of people on Xbox who really wanted to be in music or really wanted to do something else or really wanted to, you know, Peter just really wants to make games. Mm. Well, that's fun. the difference. Well, and Great I think times. that's, that's why I'm so happy to have the three of you guys here because, and I think that's why you guys are special because you actually play games. You are all gamers and that's, you know, it's pretty easy. We've seen executives at lots of companies uh, and it's very obvious, like, you don't really use the product you, that you're, that you're up there representing right now, but but you guys always do, and that's and that definitely resonates to, to us and the media to to the gamer side. So you know we appreciate that. Uh, so, Seamus, I'm curious uh, if you could have uh, one wish for Xbox One that Phil Spencer could make come true. Is there a wish? One Either like wish maybe what about like bringing an bringing an original Xbox game back or or something that maybe that you want to relay to him right now. 
Um, you almost accomplished this actually mm -hmm. uh, on Monday, but you know I think that uh, the real victory for for the real victory for gamers, but that Xbox could do is you know the most weight possible behind essentially live arcade in the indie scene. Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. really arcade, like yeah. just keep Xbox as the safest possible place it's for good. the culture of games and the art of games to to thrive. Let everybody else be commercial. Mm -hmm. You know, because you'll do great commercially if you're the place where it's safe to, to experiment. It's good that's, feedback. That's a that would, that would be awesome. And like I said on Monday, man, you you know you really got a long Thank way you. toward that. Are there are there any early games from the original Xbox days you'd love to see brought back as like rebooted, sequeled? You know, I'll tell you something. Lauren Lanning is an incredible genius. He, yeah. he just really is. Are we going yeah. Oddworld here? Is that where we're going? That's where we're going. That's well, we're I, going. not necessarily <laughs> Oddworld, but I want to see Lauren. Like really, you know, uh, uh, get it into gear again and do something because I think you know he had fits and starts, he had brilliant ideas, trouble with technology, wrong platform, wrong time, all of that. I I, I want to see him just go and go. Mm -hmm. I really do. Uh, the last question I have for, for each of the three of you is, uh, what are you each most proud of in your respective eras of Xbox? And I'll, I'll let's just go chronologically. I'll start with Seamus at the end. It's getting it out. I mean. You, it's difficult. I, we we all talk about this. Like the challenges you go through. I can't imagine, you know, being in Peter's position with the red ring of death. I just can't do it. I can't imagine having responsibility for you know such a big important part of Microsoft's business. Um, and I have no idea how we handled, uh, you know, getting that done physically as an electronics project that gets manufactured yeah. as a business. You know, I remember we, we started out, we were like looking at books on writing a business plan, you know? Um, and just even, even just in the, the big company politics of like becoming credible enough to at some point like be on stage, like essentially emceeing the keynote of CES with Bill Gates with a game console. How the hell did that happen, you know? So, you know, just being able to fake it long enough that it came out. And like we talked about before, you know, it's obvious to all of us as gamers that if you can be honest with gamers and give them great games, you'll have a business, almost no matter what you do. And so we knew that was the case and we got it over the line. Peter Moore? Red Rings of Death was, was a difficult period because I thought we'd let gamers down. People had invested. 299, 399, depending on what, what box you got, and yeah. these things were failing. And it was a pivotal moment there of whether this brand, which we had worked so hard to get going to compete with PlayStation and compete with Nintendo, um, would survive. And you know, to Seamus's point, when you within Microsoft, um, it wasn't like we were a video game company. We, we, we had to fight for relevance. We had to fight for resources. We had to fight sometimes because the internal politics of, of some Microsoft employees, and it was not the case by the time we got the 360 out the door, mm. actually resented. We were a drag on earnings. We were not making money. We were costing the company hundreds of millions, if not billions right, of dollars. Right, until a few years, three, four years into the 360, that people it started walk becoming... up to you in the, in the dining hall and say, as a shareholder, I resent the fact that you're dragging <laughs> my price down. Really? Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, yeah. So, but what we did with the 360 is start to turn Microsoft into a consumer-facing company. We started to make the entertainment side of what we were doing fun, and we turned the employees into fans. Our Halo beta, we had 15,000 Microsoft Halo employees. Halo 2, yeah. Yeah, and, and then games like, and then Crackdown, and just I can just see oh, all these Crackdown. games coming now, and we were creating fun, and we made it more of a fun place to work, even though we saw ourselves as the rebels out in Millennium there. And, and it's with great pride, I went up to see Phil a couple of weeks ago, and I never got to work in this magnificent building they're now in, because- it's Opulent we, palace. It is an opulent <laughs> palace. That's where the money goes. <laughs> But, but really surviving then. Red Rings of Death, getting through that, creating the, a, a fun I think, I think you misspoke on the Red Rings of Death too, because I know I can, I can simulate Bomber in that, that moment, but you, know, you said that he, he wanted to invest that in order to protect the brand. My belief is, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but you wanted to correct that because you wanted to keep your promise to the gamers. Yeah, I and mean, that's what Steve meant as well, is we, we, Microsoft, deliver a product and it didn't live up to what we said it would do. There was no question we needed to put that right. Yeah. No question whatsoever. And, I, and Steve is one of my favorite people of all time. And I had the great honor of working next to Steve in a lot of these things. And, and 
The other thing I think fondly about during that period, Robbie Bach and I would go over once a quarter and sit with Bill Gates for 90 minutes on a two-on-one, and it was an out-of-body experience for me to sit with Bill, who had a great deal of passion for the Xbox. Great deal of passion for the Xbox. Came to E3, was with me, we did live anywhere. I unveiled my Grand Theft Auto tattoo <laughs> with Bill on stage. <laughs> Uh, and Bill has, still has this impish sense of humor, and he took great delight, as you well know, as both of you well know, in what we did with the Xbox. Because I think he felt it was important not only to, to stop Sony stealing a march on the living room, but to bring a little bit of fun and humanity yeah. to the Microsoft yeah. brand. Remember, we were operating during this period under consent decree from the Department of Justice. Because this, right. was, a, this was a period when the US government wanted to split Microsoft in two because of Internet Explorer and That's Windows right. and create two separate companies. And we were navigating those waters at that time. And, and Bill, who was passionate about this, his dad remembers a lawyer, and Bill mm -hmm. was the pseudo general counsel uh, of Microsoft and just had a real passion about keeping this company complete. Yeah. And remember, gave Apple $150 million to keep him in business if you remember those days. Way back. So we had a competitor. Yeah. And, and at that, but, so but the thing about Bill is that he's, like, he's genuinely passionate about all this stuff. And we would you know, go and work on stuff and designs and bills of material and this crazy crap for weeks and weeks and weeks. And you know, send emails out to different people with updates and stuff. And then you go for your Bill G meeting. And he would know it all. Oh, yeah. He would know it That's all. That's an alien. And it was like, what? What? And then, and you'd think that he's some sort of machine. And then, as you're on the way out, you know, if it was hard or something, like there were uh, several times when you'd go, "Hey, you get it done." Until you and did then, and you know stupid. what? Like until you did something. Until you, if you, if you, if you, if you glossed over something, until you tried to bull something, you would get an email that said, and the subject matter would be, "This is the stupidest <laughs> effing thing I've ever seen." Yes. And I still have that email. And Spencer, I think you were part of this. Somebody told me one day we were running our MSN game servers on NT servers that mm -hmm. were basically chewing gum, duct tape, and bailing wire. The zone. Yes. And so somebody said, zone. you know, we're going to take these things down, and we've got to put them on proper servers and whatever. So I said, sure. What could go wrong? So we take down the bridge servers, all right? And I get an email the next and I, I, I didn't think twice about this. I don't know. What do I know about NT servers? But take them down. We need to update the servers because there are a lot of people who are having fun playing simple, you know, simple basic games. Maybe bridge, like bridge, bridge. Maybe bridge. bridge. Yeah. And maybe, and just maybe, no, the there two, was. I mean, just maybe the two richest men in the world yeah. enjoy some online bridge. Like to play bridge games. <laughs> there to was each other. a there was a big backlash against that. Thing. Oh my God! Yeah. So I get an email because Bill Gates goes online that night for his regular bridge game against Warren Buffett. Servers are down. Zones down. The zone is down because we're upgrading the service. Oh. And I have that classic email, which is, it's just not, you're an idiot, but these are the 55 yeah, reasons no. why you're an idiot. And I still There's, have that at home today. We, we, uh, we had nothing but support. There was a graphics meeting, and some guy from, I from, uh, uh, can't remember what, from uh, Web TV, who we questioned something. And if meeting was going great, and I and I didn't quite remember what the spec was of a chip, and so I said, "Oh no, we're better than that." And Bill, Bill looked at me and he said, "You can't get by this one on reputation. You you better go f be sure." And he got up and he left the meeting. And there were like thirty guys in this room, and everyone looked at me and I was like, "Do I have That's a job?" <laughs> oh, <laughs> way rolled. Uh, Phil Spencer, we we got we went into Bill Gates Close territory, Phil. There, which is great. <laughs> Phil Spencer, so what is Bring what is home. what is your proudest moment uh, in your in your time with Xbox? What are you most proud of? Cuphead. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it'll still seem self-serving, but the last year in uh, what the team's been able to do with. The, the brand, you know, everybody knows our two E3s ago, me fumbling the price on stage, the Sony, here's how you trade, use games, people live in submarines, like all of the stuff. Uh, hurt, hurt our fans, hurt our brand, hurt the team. And you know, to, last year's E3, I kind of called a little bit of a, a honeymoon, because it was, we were, we were kind of a new leadership team. We could stand on stage, 
show games for 90 minutes, the games drop the mic thing, and it was just refreshing for people because they didn't have to hear about television and a bunch of other things. I thought it was brave of you. You got all gamers. You said, we're okay, now we're making games. You That's had to, right. Yeah. You had to take some heat internally for that, but that was the right move all the way. And, and I think we would all say, like even this year's E3, I stand there and I say we're bringing backward compatibility and the place goes crazy. You know, the amount of code I wrote on backward compatibility, zero. You know, I, I said, hey, maybe we should go do this. And smart people go off and, and they're able to kind of do the impossible and make it possible. And uh, so for me, from a pride standpoint, I look at what the first parties are doing, which obviously I have a close affinity with, with the teams and what they've shown up with this year. But it's not just the products that they're delivering or the features that they're delivering, it's kind of how they were delivering. And I'm fixated a little bit on backward compatibility for in no other reason other than the leaders of the team actually brought them down and had them Does in it, the arena. Do, do, I mean, people need to realize that backwards compatibility is like a totally non-trivial technology right. Power issue. PC, I mean, that's absurdly difficult to do. But you know, in the feature kind of ignored, the team this last year has really engaged and uh, they've refound their stride. Yeah, we have great competition with Sony and they, they had a good show and they have great products. I saw Uncharted today, I went over to their booth and they gave me a tour, it looks fantastic, right? But you know, the industry's doing well and the team, Team Xbox, feels like uh, it, it's really, really delivering right now. And from a pride standpoint, to just kind of show up and go to the opulent Studio C and uh, see the people that are working on it and what Extraordinarily it opulent is the... <laughs> it's, it, 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 it's just so great to be part of that and sometimes stand on stage and represent the team. Uh, but the, the pride over the last year and just what the team is, is doing and kind of as much how they're doing it and why they're doing it as what they're doing uh, it, it, it is just phenomenal. So uh, to me, for just in all my time at Xbox, to see what we've been able to do, you know, it's a little similar to Red Rings in some way that you need to kind of pull yourself up, mm -hmm. say we're going to go ahead. There's nothing that says you should or you can, but you, you think you should, so you, and, it, and it happens. Well, I think and after some of that launch messaging, you were definitely in a red ring situation. Yeah. You know, the way it reacted. Yeah. You really and were. That's how the team took it. And it's, I think even in a red ring situation, it's a little bit easier in some ways because you point to this mechanical issue, heat dissipation issue, and you say, okay, physics are getting us. I yeah. mean, this was kind of self-inflicted, right? We shot ourselves in the foot standing in the water. And if people play Destiny Notes when you die. <laughs> um, and so like, we, it was, and when you're self-inflicted, sometimes from people who you know, are, are a few levels above and it feels like, man, I'm working really hard and this messaging's messing up what I'm trying to do. It was nice to see the team really engage and stay with it. And uh, yeah, so long-winded, sorry. But from a pride standpoint, definitely this last year is, kind of been what Xbox was about from the beginning and why it was yeah. created from the middle and us really becoming relevant on the 360 generation. Uh, and then right now with the team just kind of leaning all in on, no, we're doing this for the right reasons and we want to deliver a product that gamers will love. And Damn, well, you know, the idea that guys like this <laughs> would, would be running this little box business that we made <laughs> is extraordinary. It's like, that's a really cool thing, man, yeah. seeing these but guys. Let me just have the last word here because Phil, Phil is selling himself short. As a third party publisher that looked at what we needed to do to feed our families, relying upon Xbox being successful. Because what you don't want in this world is a single platform dominance. And what we love as gamers and what we love from the business point of view as third party publishers is a very competitive marketplace. Mm -hmm. And to Phil's point, there come situations, and Red Rings was it for me, but in Phil's situation, we came off an event called Newcastle, and, and as publishers we went, boy, that just didn't feel right. And the Newcastle event was a precursor to E3. It was our tent up in Yeah, and Red it was on campus, yeah. and, and the gaming message wasn't clear. The authentication of discs for the secondary market was so confusing. And there comes a situation in business or, or, or in life, there's, there's, there's a saying, cometh the hour, cometh the man. Uh, and, and what Xbox then needed was somebody that had come up through the roots of what the company was about and more recently what Xbox is about yeah. that stood for gamers and stood for bringing Xbox back to the core that Ed Fries, Kevin Backus and Seamus Blackley had built and that I had the honor of carrying and passing on then to the next generation. Um, and, and boy did Xbox need Phil Spencer. Somebody that could stand there 
speak to gamers, look them in the eye, say, we screwed up, we know what we did, we're gonna fix this, and bring this thing back within a 12-month period to where we are at E3 with a stunning press conference. And to Phil's point, and Sony did a great press conference as well, and I think we did all right as well. Yes, but did. from the perspective of a healthy industry, it's not healthy with not, without Xbox and PlayStation going at it and Nintendo starting to get some wind at their backs again. Uh, and that wouldn't have happened. Well, and you, Phil, <coughs> you talked about Thanks, having sure. starting this with Sony as that adversary to shoot for, and now look, we're you ending the conversation. Now, now we are. We have the two titans. Yeah. I could talk to you, gentlemen, all night. Uh, I cannot. You would I, have to feed us and bring us booze. We can yes. do that. As, <laughs> or maybe as someone, in the other order. Uh, whatever. <laughs> as an Xbox fan and somebody that's been covering Xbox since the beginning. I cannot thank the three of you enough for coming here and just sharing all these great thank stories. This is exactly what I pictured in my head, and, and I hope everybody watching, listening enjoyed it. Uh, this is the greatest episode of Podcast Unlocked of all time. Actually, I should quit. The show should just stop. This, <laughs> this, no, no, no. This is the last Drop episode. We're getting through 200. We're going to 400. <laughs> Come on. Uh, <laughs> Seamus Blackley, the creator of the original Xbox, thank you. Peter Moore, the man who uh, shepherded the Xbox into the HD era, and the Xbox the Red 360, well, sure and overcame the Red Ring. Thank you. Phil My Spencer, a uh, man who I've, uh, you were very generous uh, with me with your time uh, throughout E3 and, and many other times where I've interviewed you, and you again have uh, have proven to be just a, a, a great gamer and a guy who cares about, uh, you care about Xbox, and that comes through Thanks, in Mark. the games and in, and in, the, uh, and in the company and, and in the brand. So, gentlemen, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, my name is Ryan McCaffrey. This is Podcast Unlocked, the best episode that we will ever do, I promise you. And uh, keep it tuned to IGN. <laughs>